Hi everyone, it's Elliot from TutorialEdge.net and in this video we're going to be covering the concept of genetics in Go. Now for as long as I can remember being a Go developer, one of the biggest complaints about the language seems to be the lack of genetics. And if you dive into the blog posts around why Go isn't a good language for application developers, you will more often than not find that the lack of genetics is one of their supporting arguments. Thankfully though, in Go 1.18, we are now going to see the introduction of genetics into the Go ecosystem. Hooray! And that brings us full circle into the topic of this video. Now in this video, we aren't going to be arguing over the finer points of this new addition to the language. Instead, I'm going to provide everything you need in order to get up and running with genetics in your own Go applications. Cool. So the first thing you're going to need to do in order to run genetic applications in Go is to install the latest version of Go. Now, at the point of writing this or recording this, we are currently at Go 1.18 Beta 1. Now, I believe Beta 2 is in the works and Go 1.18, the stable release candidate, should be out in some time around March. Now, the command to install the Go 1.18 Beta 1 release is the following. So go install golang.org slash dl slash go 1.18 beta 1 at latest. Now with that installed, you should be able to run go 1.18 beta 1 and the version. And as you can see, I've got it all successfully installed. Cool. So let's start off with a main.go file that simply prints out the go genetics tutorial. Now the first thing we're going to want to do is to define two variables and we're going to do test age which will be of type in 64. I'm going to set this equal to 28 and I'm going to do var test age 2 and this is going to be float 32 and this will be 28.6 maybe. Cool. So if we wanted to write a genetic function that could accept either of these variables as an argument, what we could do is we could define a new genetic func and then we want to specify the type arguments or the type constraints. So I'm going to define a type constraint of age and it can take in either an int64 or a float32 type and then we specify our function arguments and I'm going to say my age which is the name of the variable and then this age type constraint like so. Cool. So next let's do fmt print line and let's print out my age which is the variable. Let's then go down into the main function and attempt to call this with both of our variables. So new genetic func test age, new genetic func test age 2. And my editor has very unhelpfully added in 64 casting. Let's remove that and save. And then let's navigate into the terminal. So go 1.18 beta 1 run main.go. And as you can see, it's been able to successfully take in either of our two variables with different types thanks to this new genetic syntax. Cool. So let's cover the syntax in a little bit more detail. Now, as you would normally do, we've, we've defined a new function and we've given the name of the function here. However, this bit of syntax here within the square braces is something that many cool developers will be unfamiliar with. Now, within here, we're effectively defining the type arguments. So we've defined a new type argument that is called age. And then we're specifying the list of different types that this age could conceivably be. Now, in this case, we've got two types. However, if we wanted to accept any type without doing any sort of type checking, we could use this any keyword like so. If you go down into the terminal and try and run this once again, you should see that this has no real impact on our function. And it's still been able to print out the two variables that we passed into this genetic function. Now, what happens if we were to define a var my string, for example, and this will be of type string, and let's say tutorial edge. 
let's try and pass this into our new genetic function. And my string, save this and let's run it again. Now, as you can see here, nothing has complained, but that's purely down to luck as the fmt.fprintline um, function takes in a variadic interface and is able to handle any type within Go. Cool. So let's say we wanted to do something slightly more useful than just print out whatever value or variable that is passed into our function. Say we wanted to increment the value of any number type by one. Well, we can do this like so. So let's cast any of the my age variables passed in and increment by one. And let's do fmt print line and the value. And let's remove this. Now we know we can't increment the my string variable by one. So let's remove this and this. And let's try and run this in the terminal and see what happens. So go.118 beta1 run main.go. And as you can see, the compiler complains saying you cannot convert my age variable of type age constrained by any to type int. Now this is good. This effectively means it's not going to be the wild west when developing genetic functions. There is going to be some logic or some rules behind how you implement your genetic functions. Now, if we want to convert my age to type in, what we can do is we can revert back to the type constraints that we had previously. And let's say n64 or float32. And let's try run this again. So go 118 to one run main.go and as you can see it has converted our values to 28 and then appended one to those values now in this example when we converted 28.6 to int we lost some of the precision so what we can effectively do is we can convert any incoming number to float and let's say 32 and we can preserve this precise number here when we're doing our computation and as you can see this works as intended we've now got 29 and 29.6 printed out now what happens if you are developing a library or a package that other people are going to consume repeating this and adding all of the different types over and over and over again is going to get really boring really quickly and it's going to look quite ugly to be honest so what we can do is we can define a number interface and we can pass in all of the different types. So n8 and n16 and n32 and n64 float32 and float64. And I'll just leave it there for now. And then we can take this type constraint and we can replace this here with number. And let's sanity check to ensure that everything still works as expected. And as you can see, yes, it does. It takes in both of our different types and computes them as we expect. Okay, so we've seen that the basic syntax for genetics and how we can define type constraints and genetic functions. Now let's see how we could use this in a practical example and implement a bubble sort algorithm that will accept any slice of any type. So func, bubble sort, we're going to define the type as in our number. And then the input is going to be a slice of type n, like so. And it's going to return a slice of type n. Cool. So let's first get the length of the input. Let's set swat as equal to true. Let's do for swat and swapped is equal to false for i is equal to zero i is less than n minus one i plus plus and let's do the comparison so if input i is greater than input i plus one input i oops input i plus 1 is equal to input i plus 1 and input i. And we'll swap these, va these values here using this syntax. Cool. 
And let's set swap to equal to true. And at the bottom of this, let's do return input. Perfect. So we should now have a bubble sort implementation that accepts any type of any slice. And let's try this out now. So let's do the following. So list is equal to slice of type int32. Let's do four, three, one, five, six. And let's do list, and we'll call this list float is equal to float 32, four, 0 0.2 for 4.3, 7.6, 2.4, and that should be enough. And then let's do the following. So let's do sorted, softed, sorted is equal to bubble sort. Let's pass in the list of ints for the first one. And let's print this out. FMT print line sorted. And let's do sort sorted floats, not softed floats. And let's pass this into the bubble sort implementation. So list float. And again, let's print this out. So sorted floats. Cool. And we can get rid of this as it's no longer needed. And let's go into the terminal. Let's do go 1.18 beta 1 run main.go. And hopefully this is going to set sort both of these slices for us. And it has, as you can see, 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1 5, 2 4, 4 3, and 7.6. Perfect. So this implementation of the bubble sort should hopefully give you some indication as to how powerful genetics is going to be at removing things like code duplication in your own Go applications. If you were building this and you wanted to be able to do this for int32s and float32s, you would have to build a specific implementation for each of these different types in the old world in Go. Cool. So that's all we're going to cover in this tutorial. Now, so far, we've covered the basic syntax and how to do things like type constraints and genetic functions. We've also demonstrated the power of this new genetic syntax by implementing a genetic version of the bubble sort algorithm. Now, if you're interested in learning more Go, then I'm going to take a minute to plug my own website, tutorialedge.net. For $7.99 every month, you can participate in some of these courses and do things like build microservices in Go or improve your testing ability. There's a whole heap of different programming courses here available to you. And I'm going to leave a link to that in the description below. Now, if you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and subscribe to my channel for more programming content. Cheers.